Good morning, church. The first reading is taken from the book of Nehemiah, uh, chapter 8, verses 1 to 8. Nehemiah 8. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gates. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning till midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Metahiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hukiah, and Masiah on his right hand, and Padaiah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashem, Heshbadanat, Zechariah, and Mashalem on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Joshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Echab, Sabbatai, Hodiah, Masaiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabat, Hanan, Pelaiah, the Levites, helped the people to understand the law. While the people remained in their places, they read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and it gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. This is the word of the Lord. Would you please stand for the reading of the Gospel? The Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 13, beginning at verse 18. Glory to Christ our Saviour. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the gospel of Christ. Christ. Our Lord. Father, we come before your holy word. We pray, Lord. Open our hearts, open our spiritual eyes, Lord, to behold wondrous things in your word. And that, Lord, you may help us to be not just hearers, but doers. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you please be seated? What is your appetite for the Word of God? What is the level of hunger that you have for God's Word? So pause and think, perhaps on a scale of 1 to 10. At this present point in time, how would you evaluate your appetite and hunger for God's Word? We all know that God's Word is crucial. The challenge is acting upon it and engaging in God's Word, whether individually, in small groups, and here in church. 
so the challenge for us is, are we engaging in God's Word? Surveys show that less than 20% of churchgoers read their Bible on a daily basis. So this is across countries. I don't know what the figure is for St. Paul's. But in the U.S., it's been about 14% from 2011 to 2019. And the next question I have is, has, what do you think is the impact of the pandemic on scriptural engagement? Do you think the pandemic has caused people to read the scriptures more and more regularly or less? How many of you say more? How many of you say less? Okay. Yeah, one would think it'd be more, right? Because pandemic is fear, and so, you know, read, go to the Word, go to God. So I was surprised, actually, when I read a survey uh, by Christianity Today. Of course, it's American, but uh, I think it would still hold true for other nations as well. So the survey shows that, in actual fact, Bible engagement or church goes reading the Bible falls by 5%. So I said just now, right, 2011 and 2019, the U.S. is 14%. But between 2019 and 2020, 2020 is when the pandemic hit, the percentage actually went down. Now, the question is why? Why do you think engagement in Scripture fell with the pandemic? It's because of safe distancing and the inability of the church to gather. It's the relational aspect of the church that spurs the reading of God's Word. So in Acts 2, when you read about the church in Acts, it focused on the apostles' teaching and on fellowship, on the gathering and meeting together and sharing with one another, the sharing of lives. How important it is for this fellowship and this engagement with one another for scriptural engagement. So the survey is by Christianity Today, and this is the quote. From the, from the survey, July 2020. The study supports the idea that the church plays a significant role in benefiting people's well-being and scripture engagement. To increase scripture engagement, we must increase relational connections with one another through, through the church. The pandemic and now this survey have shown that when relational church engagement goes up, so the scripture engagement. But when it goes down, scripture engagement goes down with it. So friends, I'm glad that you're here in the house of God. And while we cannot mingle in church, there are many places outside, yeah? In Heartland Mall, in the, all the coffee shops, to go in groups of eight, and to fellowship and to connect with one another, and also in the cell groups, the small groups. That relational aspect spurs spiritual growth and maturity, and also in growing, in engaging with Scripture. So today we focus on chapter 8, chapter 8 of Nehemiah. The wall has already been built, right? In chapter 6, 13 chapters in the book of Nehemiah, and we've been faithfully going through it from January, actually, because we took a break in Lent. But in chapter 6, the wall has been done. And we are told it was done in how many days? 52 days. 52 days. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15, tells us that it was completed in just 52 days. And we, we read also that it was a clear testimony that God enabled it. God enabled the building of the walls in such a short time and with all the opposition that they had. Now, shouldn't Nehemiah then have gone back to Persia? Because remember in chapter 1, he went and asked the, the, the king of Persia, Artaxerxes, to go, right? Because the people are in disgrace, he needs to rebuild the walls. Now that the walls are rebuilt, shouldn't he come back? 
Walls are built in 52 days. How long was Nehemiah in Jerusalem? How long was Nehemiah in Jerusalem? 12 years. Uh, Georgie is right in front and he's saying, because he preached on that from chapter 5. <laughs> so it's fresh on his mind. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 5 verse 14 tells us that Nehemiah was governor for 12 years. What does that tell us, friends? It's, it's that it's, it's the, the walls com- in terms of building is shorter compared to the amount of time, effort, and energy to build a community and to build a strong community rooted in God's Word is a process. And so we at St. Paul's are in this process of building a community rooted in God. And it will take time, it will take energy, and it will take all of us. And today it's significant because we are commissioning our PCC leaders. And in the commitments that they will make is a commitment to Scripture, that they will be rooted in Scripture, that St. Paul's Church will be a church and a community rooted in God's Word. So as we come into chapter 8, we see the priority to ground the people in the Word of God. You notice they, they didn't celebrate, no? The dedication and celebrations for the completion of the wall are actually in chapter 12. So they deferred the celebration. Not only that, they deferred the repopulation of Jerusalem. Jerusalem at this point in time in chapter 8 actually was a ghost town. Because as we've been going through the book, most of the Jews were living in the surrounding towns. A small number were in Jerusalem. They would leave their towns, whether it's Tekoa, Jericho, and come. And then they would commute, you see. And then when opposition was great, they stayed in Jerusalem to, to protect the city. So even the repopulation of Jerusalem was not a priority. Neither was it the celebration of the completion of the world. The priority for Nehemiah, for Ezra and the leaders was to ground the people in the Word of God. So are we a community hungry for God's Word? And it begins in chapter 8, verse 1, And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. Where did they gather from? Where did the people gather from? They traveled from their their towns. So the verse before chapter 8, verse 1, which is uh, chapter 7, verse 73, tells us that. It tells us that when the seventh month had come, the people of Israel were in their towns. In all these different towns that they had gone to, they had gone to after building the walls. But on the first day of the seventh month, they gathered back. And it's reasonable to assume that Nehemiah had given them this instruction. Go back, but on the first day of the seventh month, come back again. And it shows here in verse 1, that there was such a unity and a desire, they gathered as one man. They all came. It's not as if some of them said, I uh, forget about Nehemiah's instruction. We'll just get on with our lives. The wall has been built. We'll get on with our lives. No. They gathered as one man in the square. And not only that, they tell Ezra to bring the book of the law. Right? And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. There's this hunger and desire for the word of God. So you can imagine the hundreds or thousands of people there in the water gate, and they are calling. Now, some of you have been to rock concerts. Huh? You know, before the concert starts, you're cheering and chanting, right? For whoever it is. Uh, my time is Michael Jackson. I don't know for you all who it's going to be. But you can imagine, uh, they're there and perhaps they say, we want Ezra. We want Ezra. We want the Word of God read. Such is the hunger and desire 
for the Word of God. So there is a deep hunger for God's Word. And we find in verse 3, he read it, read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. A few things to unpack from this scripture, and I hope uh, the projectionist can leave this slide on. Firstly, who are gathered? Who are gathered? This verse says three, three groups, right? Men, women, and all who could understand. It's the children and youth who are there, listening to God's word. And so as I read this, I said, yeah, we've got to build the next generation. I thank God for our children's ministry and also the youth ministry, Lorraine and Pastor Jason, working hard to build the next generation, to ground them in the word of God. But it's also the parents that need to play a part, especially for children growing up, to ground them in the word of God. So that's the first thing to notice. The second thing is, hey, how long were they there? Listening to Ezra. Is it a 30-minute sermon like what I'm doing now? <laughs> it says from early morning until midday. That's about four or five hours, you know, of just... And it's not as if Ezra is preaching. He is reading the scriptures. The law is Genesis to Deuteronomy. He's reading portions of the, the Word of God. And, the, and then it also says, not only are they... They there standing uh, for these many hours. They are attentive to the book of the law. They are eager, listening, seeking to understand. If I can encourage you at St. Paul's, one thing I found is that there is a deep hunger amongst you. You know, as I preach God's word, and I've checked this with other, other preachers, it's true. You have a hunger for the word of God. Because we can tell from your eyes, tell from the way you're taking down notes that there's a deep hunger. And so may you continue to sustain it. That God will deepen and strengthen this community rooted in God's Word. So I do want to encourage you and to tell you that your attentiveness is encouraging the preachers to spend time to prepare God's Word. Because I see that hunger in you. Now, the people also had a great reverence for God's Word. And they responded to the preaching of God's Word. How did they do it? First, they did it physically. So, verse 5 tells us, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, what happened? All the people stood. Stood not because of Ezra, but stood because of the Word of God. Not that they were worshipping the Word of God, but because they recognised that this is God's revelation. This is God's holy Word. And they stand in reverence and awe and in submission to the Word of God. What a deep hunger for God's Word. Then the next thing we read uh, that I want to highlight is verse 8. So they read from the book of the, the... They meaning now is the Levites. Now I must thank David. Huh? It's not an easy passage to read with all these Hebrew names. Huh? But yeah, and he did well. They read from the book, the Levites. So Ezra pre, uh, is reading the word, and then these 13 Levites uh, that are named, they now go and read from the book and, and repeat, I suppose, and also translate because the, the Torah would have been in Hebrew. The lingua franca there would have been Aramaic. So they need to translate so that the people can understand. And they also interpret, help in the interpretation. They give the sense and the meaning so that the people can understand the word. You see small groups here, you know? It's like I'm preaching, I'm, if I'm preaching now and then I say, you know, break up into groups and then I have all the cell leaders, ministry leaders explaining the meaning of it. That's what's happening in Nehemiah chapter 8. There's 
that you have this relational aspect, this people asking questions, resolving issues, so that they have a clear understanding of God's Word. So two responses of the community that I want to highlight in their listening and understanding of God's Word. So the key in this first eight verses is their deep hunger. But I want to cover the whole chapter and give you a bit, bit of an overview in terms of their response. How did they respond? How they responded with a heart of remorse and contrition, repentance for their sin. They were quickened in their hearts as the Scriptures were read. And so we read in verse 9, all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. So I do want to encourage all the Scripture readers like David and others who read. It's not just the preaching of God's Word, it's the reading of God's Word that convicts hearts, especially. And they are weeping because, and also with the understanding that the Levites have given them, they recognize their sin. Whether it's intermarriage um, and neglecting uh, God's house, not observing the Sabbath, these are sins that quicken them. And they are weeping and grieving. And so, the public reading of Scripture has power. That's why in Anglican churches, we often read different portions of Scripture, whether it's Old Testament. In, in traditional Anglican churches, there are three, you know, Old Testament, Psalm, and New Testament. So, there is a heritage of understanding that the public reading of Scripture is important. And Paul emphasizes that in 1 Timothy 4. In encouraging Timothy, who's young, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. How to do that? How to, to be an example? It's the next verse, right? Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture to exhortation and to teaching. Exhortation is preaching of God's Word. Of course, in those days, it was important, public reading was especially important because each person didn't have the Scriptures. So they, it was read, you see, so they needed to hear. But I do believe it still holds true today that the public reading of Scripture ministers and so I thank God for the Scripture readers and the way in which they prepare to read with faith, that it will stir faith within us and stir, in this case, repentance and confession of sin. So a response of heartfelt contrition and remorse for sin. But also the response of the people in Nehemiah 8 was a response of complete obedience to God's Word. A response of complete obedience to God's Word. So if you scan through uh, verse 9 to 11, there's a phrase that's repeated three times. What is that phrase? So if you have your Bibles, you can look at it. Verses 9 to 11. What is repeated three times in these three verses? Yeah, Pastor Leon. Do not mourn. Right? This day is holy to the Lord. Do not mourn or weep. The question is why? Surely if I'm preaching and there are people mourning and weeping, I would not want to quench the Spirit, right? Because God is working. Why is it here that the leaders, Nehemiah, Ezra, and the Levites are telling them, this day is holy to the Lord, do not mourn or weep. What, when they say this day is holy, what day is it? We are told in chapter 8, verse 2, that it is the first day of the seventh month. What is the first day of the seventh month, people of God? 
It's the Feast of Trumpets. It's the beginning of the Jewish New Year. It's looking ahead to the 10th day of the seventh month, which is the Day of the Atonement, and the 15th day of the seventh month is the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths. So the first day of the seventh month is a day of joy, of celebration. And so as we go back to Leviticus and God's word to Moses, speak to the people of Israel, saying, in the seventh month, on the first day of the seventh month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial pro proclaimed with blasts of trumpets, a holy convocation. So this is no time to mourn and, and weep. Although it is good that they are recognizing their sin, but this is not the right time. God's word is saying, this day is holy and you need to rejoice for the provision of God, for the atonement of sins. Has it pointed to Jesus and all that Jesus would give for the people living then? Pointing to the Feast of Tabernacles and God's faithfulness in leading them through the 40 years. The, festival, the Feast of Tabernacles of Woods is the temporary shelter that the Israelites lived for 40 years. And what do the people do? They respond in obedience to God's word. Right? Verse 12, And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. So I believe the Levites, Moses, uh, Nehemiah and Ezra, had taken this scripture in Leviticus and elsewhere to explain to them why this day was holy to the Lord. And they responded in obedience to God's word. The other aspect of obedience has to do with what they are taught subsequently. And so as we move to verse 13, we are now on the second day of the seventh month. What happens? There is a select group of, of people to be taught. It's the heads of fam fathers' houses, the priests and the Levites. They come together for advanced Bible study, right? And they are found in the law, verse 14, that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month. And so they are told to go, go and collect olive branches, myrtle branches, palm branches, and go and make boots. And what do they do? What do the people do? They obey. There is total obedience to the commands in God's word. Because since the time of Joshua, they had not celebrated the feast of boots in the way that they were meant to, fully. And so they did. They went and made boots, each on his roof and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the square at the water gate and in the square at the gate of Ephraim. You know, when the people of God is committed with having a hunger for God's word and obeying God's word, there's joy but there's also a tremendous witness. Can you see and imagine in your mind's eye the city of Jerusalem and all these temporary shelters on the rooftop, in their courts, in the place of worship, and in the square? And any visitor that's coming in, and there were many there, would ask, right, what's all this about? And so it's an opportunity to testify and to witness and the witness is in, when I say each on his roof, is in the home, to the children, to the extended family, in the courts of the house, in the places of worship, and in the square. The witness and testimony of the people of God in the marketplace. So when the people of God are obedient to God's word, there is tremendous joy, independent of circumstances, and there is tremendous witness to a watching world. 
So friends, I began by asking, what is the level of your hunger for God's Word? What is the level of your appetite for God's Word? And I pray that you will ask the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can quicken our hearts and give us this hunger. So as we respond today to the message of God's Word and to this rich chapter in chapter 8, that in the forming of the community of the people of God, the Word of God has to be central. And so too for us. So it's not just an individual thing, it's for us also as a community of God's Word, growing in hunger and desiring to hear and know and obey God's Word together as the people of God. And as we do that, we will be a shining witness to a watching world and to draw many to know the love of Jesus in our hearts. So will you bow your hearts with me in prayer? Gracious God and Father, Lord, we thank you for your word given to us, penned by human writers, but Lord, put together by you, by the Holy Spirit. So we pray, may we delight in your word, may we cherish your word, may we engage in your word. May we grow in our understanding of your word, Lord, that it would change and mold us to be more and more like Jesus. So I pray, Lord, for each one. Just ask you to respond in your hearts and to the Holy Spirit's prompting. What patterns can you change to give time to give energy to knowing and understanding this word. This word that brings life, that brings healing, that brings reconciliation, that the things that are eating away our time and energy, that the Lord will help us to carve out unhurried time to grow deep into the Word of God, and also for the community of God's believers, that cell leaders, PCC leaders, ministry leaders will grow in the Word and will teach the Word, that it is not just a Levitical role, that this is not just the role of the priests and the pastors, but this is a role for the people of God, those who have the gift of teaching, that they will rise up and be, Lord, and fulfill the role that you have given to them to equip the church, to build the church in your word, that we would be strengthened as a community, growing in you and reaching out to others. So help us, Lord, to be a community hungry for your word, responding with heartfelt contrition and having complete obedience to the commands written in Holy Scripture. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's respond. So just turn our eyes to the Lord. This is the agreement. This is the agreement. Yeah, let's, let's just all stand here. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. And 
Father, may we never, never be forsaken by you as your word says. Help us to always hunger for your word. Yes, Lord. Make us hunger that we will read it, we will understand it, not with our heads, Lord, but with our hearts as the Holy Spirit reveals to us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Hi, good morning, church. I'd just like to invite Ben to say a few words to all of us. Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, on, on behalf of the William family, my sisters, my family, and my brother's family, uh, I want to thank all of you for your messages of condolences, your care and concern, and your prayers during our recent bereavement. Uh, my sister Elizabeth has gone to be with the Lord. I think many of you know her. And we are confident that she has finished the race well and that now she is with her beloved Lord. But once again, uh, we really saw the body of Christ in action. We want to thank uh, Wicca and his wife, the staff of the church, and all of you for being with us during this time. Thank you for your support. God bless you. Well, brothers and sisters, just to uh, share two announcements. Uh, firstly, uh, prayer and praise, which used to be at the last Friday of the month, which is supposed to happen on the 30th of April, we are now shifting it to the first Friday of the month, which means April we won't have, but on the 7th of May, we will have it on the first Friday of the month. And guess what? 
is no longer virtual. That's, me, that's right. That means we're coming on site to meet. And the venue will be the second sanctuary, which is behind the main sanctuary. So we encourage you to come. You've heard the word of God, the reading of the word, and then time of prayer. So we invite you to please come for the prayer and praise on the 7th of May, 8 p.m. at the second sanctuary. Second um, announcement is uh, kindergarten. Yes, registration is now open for 2022. So those church members who have children, uh, or maybe you have grandchildren who fit the bill, Please uh, take note uh, of the dates which are shown up there, 20th April to 30th April 2021, or you can even call the church office. And for those of you all in the SPC updates, you would have received in the e-bulletin, all these announcements will be also over there. That's all I have for you. Now over to Vicar for a special announcement. <laughs> I want to thank uh, all who participated in the AGM uh, last week, and uh, today we want to uh, introduce them and also uh, pray for them and commission them. Uh, so the team for the coming year, we have the Vickers Warden, uh, Georgie, so you can please uh, stand. Yeah, Georgie. Uh, People's Warden, uh, Benjamin William. Okay, then the next three are Synod reps, so they are on their second year. There's a three-year appointment to be on the Synod. So we have Arul John, uh, Benny Khan, Prasanna. Okay, Prasanna on this side. And then um, Adrian, Adrian, uh, Daniel Tan. See where is he? He's there, back there, drumming away. Uh, Christina Liu. Where is she? Oh, okay, behind the pillar. Okay, hi. Uh, Eric Tan, Pastor Eric Tan. Yeah. Okay, Xavier Kiruba, from the Tamil side. Where's Xavier? The corner. corner there. Oh, yes, that's right, that's right. <laughs> okay. Okay, the reason they are standing where they are is because of COVID. Yeah, normally in the commissioning, they'll come up front. Um, I think it's also good that they are representing you. They are leaders in your midst with you and journeying with you. So we'll, uh, yeah, we'll have this uh, time of commissioning. Can we have the first slide? Okay. St. Paul, writing to the Christians in Rome, says, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is in serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So the first two responses are responses that the church will make to stand and to with these leaders and to support and pray for them. So will you please uh, respond um, with gusto, okay? People of God, we are all called to different ministries, but as one people, we are to seek to live out God's purpose for this church. As we commission these PCC members today, will you, with them and as faithful disciples of Christ, Renew your commitment to the loving service of God, of one another, and of all people. These people have been appointed as members of the parochial church council of St. Paul's Church. Will you, as the people of God, constantly support and pray for them? I now address the PCC leaders, and uh, Georgie has a mic, so uh, you can hear the response. But the other leaders, yeah, please respond uh, together as well. You are appointed into this office. Will you seek to carry out your duties prayerfully and in a spirit of humility and with mutual respect and collaboration with those in this congregation? With the help of God, we will. Will you be faithful in the reading of Holy Scriptures, 
so as to know the will of God in all your decisions. With the help of God, we will. Will you do your best to pattern your life and that of your family in accordance with the teachings of Christ, so that you may be a wholesome example to all people? With the help of God, we will. Will you in all things seek not to pursue your own glory, but only the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ? With the help of God, we will. Will you seek to develop the faith, gifts, and skills God has given you as you share in Christ's mission and ministry? With the help of God, we will. I commission you as members of the parochial church council of St. Paul's Church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, may God grant you grace, wisdom, and joy as you live out this calling. Father, we come before you, and Lord, for those who are standing as leaders of your church, Lord, I pray your hand, and we pray for each one of them, for your hand of grace and strength to be with them. Watch over their families, Lord. Protect them from every attack of the evil one as they serve you. And may they serve, Lord, knowing your truth, growing deep in your word, and being a model for others. So I thank you for them that along with me and the clergy and the pastors, we will serve your church and bring glory and honor to your name. So I thank you for their faithful service and sacrifice. And I pray, Lord, your anointing upon each of them as they serve you. Living God, draw us deeper into your love. Jesus, Christ, our Lord, send us to care and serve others. Holy Spirit, make us proclaimers of good news. Stir us, strengthen us, teach and inspire us to live your love with generosity, joy and courage to fulfill your commission to us in this world in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So let us encourage our leaders. We also continue to uphold them and their families in prayer.